Okay, Ruthie, do you know how to make the door open? Can you show me? <gasps> yeah, what happens? The door gets open wider, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, and then you close the door. Do you know how a door opens? How does a door open? Um. It opens on its hinges. Yeah, do you see right there in the corner? Right there in the corner? That big metal thing on the side and down there? Those things are called hinges. Yeah, go ahead and open up the door real wide. Yeah, the bigger, the more you open up the door, the wider it gets, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, honey, hey, that's today's lesson. Can you say the hinge theorem? Hinge theorem. Hinge theorem, yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and start. Hey, you know what? I love you. Welcome to lesson 5.6, Inequalities in Two Triangles. Let's go ahead and begin the warm-up. Go ahead and pause the video now. QR is less than QD is less than DR. X is greater than 4. LZ is 6 meters. The name we're looking for is perpendicular bisector. The items we need in this lesson, good old pencil and paper, ruler, protractor, and a calculator. Vocabulary terms, hinge theorem, included angle, comparable, sufficient, insufficient, testable, absolute value, ordering, range, bounded inequality, unbounded inequality. Our objective is simple, to apply inequalities in two triangles. Here's the motivation. Two laptops of the same model have congruent dimensions. One has an angle between the monitor and the keyboard that is larger than the other. Therefore, the opposite side of that angle is larger than the laptop of lesser angle. Here's how we're going to do the lesson. We've got two new theorems in this lesson, the hinge theorem and the converse of the hinge theorem. We're going to go ahead and inspect both. We're going to read both, look at the hypotheses for both and the conclusions for both. And then we're going to try and learn these theorems by example. So first, notice my hypothesis is underlined. If two corresponding pairs of sides of two triangles are congruent and their included angles are not congruent, then the third side opposite the larger angle, larger included angle is the larger of the two third sides. Notice here that AB is congruent to DG and that AC is congruent to DF. Now it's given to me, I may allow, I'm allowed to assume that angle D really is larger than angle A. That's given information. That's part of the hypothesis. The conclusion that this theorem allows me to make is that FG, the side, is larger than the side BC. Notice that A is included between AB and AC and that D is included between DF and DG. This is very important because the hinge and the converse of the hinge theorem talk about included angles. Here's the converse. My hypothesis is underlined. My conclusion is in bold. If there are two pairs of corresponding congruent sides of two triangles and the third side of one triangle is larger than the other, then the intended angle opposite this larger side is the larger of the two angles. Now here AB is still congruent to DG, 
AC is still congruent to DF, that's given information. But here in the converse, I'm allowed to assume it's given to me that side FG really is larger than side BC. So this converse theorem allows me to conclude that the measure of angle D must be the larger of the two angles. So in other words, the measure of angle D is larger than the measure of angle A. Again, D and A are both included angles. Okay, we've got the two theorems. Now let's look at some examples. Here's a picture of the, hinver of the hinge theorem and the converse of the hinge theorem. Now, notice that this one's moving, and if it goes all the way back, right now the two angles are congruent to each other. The two triangles are congruent to each other by side, angle, side. But the moment I allow one of the triangles to grow, let's pause that here, notice that AC is still congruent to DF, and notice that AB is still congruent to DE, but angle A is the larger of the two angles. A is included between the two sides here, D is included between the two sides here, but angle A is larger than angle D. Well, the hinge theorem therefore says that CB, the side which is opposite of angle A, must now be larger than FE, which you can see from the video. The converse Let's go back. The converse is going to go in the opposite direction. Okay, so how does the converse work? Well, the converse works like this. Let's go ahead and let the triangle grow. This time, I still have AC congruent to DF, and I still have AB congruent to DE. However, I'm also given that CB is larger than FE which means that angle A, which is opposite of CB, must be larger than angle D, which is opposite of FE. That, in its very basic form, is both the hinge theorem and the converse of the hinge theorem. You need to know what's given in both theorems and what each theorem allows you to conclude. Okay. Here's another example. Let's compare the given measures. So compare simply means I want to put an ordering on the two measures. I want to say one is smaller than another, one is larger than another, or they're equal, whichever is true. So in the first picture, I want to compare angle EGH with angle EGF. Well, notice that FG and HG are both 12 units. I know that EG is congruent to EG by the reflexive property of congruence. So Looking at EF, I know that this measure is 10. Looking at EH, I can see that this measure is 9. All I need to do now is go opposite to the side EF, and I see the angle EGF. Well, because 10 is larger than 9, this immediately means that angle EGH is smaller than angle EGF. This is the converse of the Hinge theorem, because the conclusion here is about the ordering of the angles and not the sides. Let's look at the second example. I see that BD is congruent to BD by the reflexive property of congruence. I see that AD is congruent to CD because that's given. Now I look opposite the 65 degrees and I see BC. I look opposite the 64 degrees and I see AB, which means that BC must be the larger of the two sides. What allows me to conclude this is the hinge theorem. So when I use the word comparable, uh, what I mean here is that I can assign some ordering between the two figures, which is either going to be less than, greater than, or equal to. Let's go ahead and prove the converse of the hinge theorem. The really cool thing that we're going to do here is we're going to use an indirect method. First, let's look at the givens. We're given that PQ is congruent to XY. We're given that PR is congruent to XZ. And we're also given that QR is larger than YZ. What we want to do is prove that angle P is greater than the measure of angle X. Indirectly, what do we do? Well, we assume that the measure of angle P is not greater than the measure of angle X. And this gives us two possibilities. This either means that the measure of angle P is less than the measure of angle X, or it means that the measure of angle P is equal to the measure of angle X. 
Okay, well, let's look at the consequences. First, case one. If it really is the truth that the measure of angle P is less than the measure of angle X, well, then that means that QR is less than YZ by the hinge theorem. But that contradicts the given information, and that's when you know you've encountered something ridiculous when you contradict the given information. The given information was that QR was larger than YZ. So we know it can't be the case that the measure of angle P is less than, it is not less than uh, the measure of angle X, or that it is less than. Case two, if the measure of angle P is equal to the measure of angle X, then angle P must be congruent to angle X by definition of congruence. So therefore, triangle PQR is congruent to triangle XYZ by side angle side congruence. But if that's the case, then QR would have to be congruent to YZ by CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And that would mean that QR is equal in measure to YZ. That also contradicts the given information. So we know it's not the case that the measure of angle P is equal to the measure of angle X. Therefore, the assumption that the measure of angle P is not greater than the measure of angle X is false. Well, that means that the measure of angle P really is greater than the measure of angle X, and that's what we wanted to prove. Proved. Let's compare these given measures. I want to compare AC and DG. AC is going to be less than DG because the included angle of 117 is less than the included angle of 119. That's the hinge theorem. Now let's compare the measure of angle ADB and the measure of angle CDB. Well, the measure of angle ADB is less than the measure of angle CDB because 4 is larger than 3. That's the converse of the hinge theorem. Let's compare WQ and TQ. WQ is larger than TQ because 90 degrees is larger than 70 degrees. Let's talk about finding ranges. We're going to start with a basic fact. Here in geometry, both of the angles here must be positive. So we're going to tr create two inequalities. 2x minus 8 has to be larger than 0, and x plus 5 must be larger than 0. Solving both gives us x is greater than 4, and x is greater than negative 5. Now here's the catch. If x is greater than 4, then it's also going to be greater than negative 5. So we don't need that second case, since x has to be greater than 4. Right now, that means that x is greater than 4 is sufficient. The word sufficient simply means enough. Now, it also has to be the case that 2x minus 8 is greater than x plus 5 by the converse of the hinge theorem. Solving this inequality gives us x is greater than 13. Well, now we have a problem because x is greater than 13 is now the new sufficient condition. If a number is larger than 13, it also is naturally larger than x is greater than 4. So we no longer need the condition of x greater than 4, and our sufficiency changes. And this is our final sufficient condition. x is greater than 13. That's called the range for x. Now this is called an unbounded inequality, because x can be anything all the way to infinity, and it never really will reach infinity. So. Uh, in this case, x could be 10 or 20 or 30. And actually, we have to make a sidestep here, because even though mathematically x greater than 13 is possible, uh, we're not going to allow angles that are greater than 180. So from that perspective, it's really not unbounded. But for the purposes of this problem here, we're going to allow x to be greater than 13. Amanda found that the materials in the art room were sufficient to help her complete the project she was working on. Let's go ahead and find another set of ranges. Now, both sides must be positive. 
Okay, to be positive, you have to be greater than zero. So I set both sides greater than zero. Solving each inequality, I get x is greater than negative 7, and I get x is greater than 2.5. Well, the first condition is not needed, since the second condition says x has to be greater than 2.5. Well, if it is, then it's obviously going to be greater than negative 7. So we don't need that first condition. So right now, our sufficiency lies in that x is greater than 2.5. However, by the hinge theorem, it also must be true that 2x minus 5 is less than x plus 7. Solving this inequality gives us x is less than 12. Now that doesn't contradict the first condition, x is greater than 2.5. However, our sufficiency no longer lies in x being greater than 2.5. It's simply not enough to say that x is greater than 2.5 because we've now discovered that x must also be less than 12. So that condition is no longer sufficient. What we now have is a bounded inequality, and this is the sufficient condition. As long as x is between 2.5 and 12, what we have here is a bounded inequality, and we know we have a true set of triangles. In other words, triangles that can be realistic. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate. What I'm looking at here is a pre-image. I'm going to create an image. I'm going to translate this picture down and then to the right just a little bit. And now let's go ahead and choose some values for x. So let's go ahead and let x equal 11.8. Let's plug that in and see what we get. Notice 11.8 is within the bounds. It's greater than 2.5 and less than 12. Plug it in, I get this side here to be 18.8 and this side here to be 18.6, everything works. This is a realistic set of triangles. But let me choose a number now that's outside of the bounds, like 2.3. Well, that's not between 2.5 and 12. I plug that in, I get 9.3, and I plug it in again the other side, I get negative 0.4, and there's a problem. Having a negative length doesn't make any sense in basic Euclidean geometry. Let's look at the big picture. Let's talk about something that will serve you well in mathematics beyond simple geometry down the road to maybe pre-calculus or even calculus. In mathematics, when we wish to test where an expression is positive, we make it greater than zero. If we wish to make certain that the value of an expression is positive or zero, we take its absolute value. So know the difference between testing whether an expression is greater than zero. That's called making an expression testable and knowing for certain when the expression is positive or zero. And by doing that, we do the absolute value. Let's compare the two uh, situations. First, I'm going to take the expression 2x minus 5, make it greater than negative 10. What I'm hunting for here is what range of x's make this statement true. Well, if I solve it using algebra, I now know that as long as x is larger than negative 2.5, then it's true. So as long as the value of x is greater than negative 2.5, then the expression will be positive. This was a test to see where the expression was positive. In the other case of absolute value, let's take the absolute value of 2x minus 5, and let's choose a number at random. So I'm going to choose negative 3, and I'm going to plug it in using the order of operations. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11. And the absolute value of negative 11 is 11. Because of the absolute value, it does not matter what value of x we choose. The result will always be positive or 0. Before we move on to the next slide, can you tell me which value of x would make this 0? If you said 2.5, you're absolutely right. Given that FH is a median and the measure of angle FHG is larger than the measure of angle FHD, prove that FG is larger than FD. We're going to leave this proof to you, 
except the key to understanding this proof is knowing what a median is. So if you don't remember what a median is, you've got to go back and you've got to research that. Look at what the consequences are for FH being a median. Once you know what a median is again, try this one on your own. Turns out the proof in this case is actually just three to four steps total. Here's the lesson quiz. Go ahead and pause the video now. Since KL is congruent to NL, that's given, and that LM is congruent to ML, that's the reflexive property of congruence, the measure of KLM is equal to the measure of KMN plus the measure of NLM, that's the angle addition postulate. Thus, angle KLM is greater than angle NLM by the comparison property of inequality, and that means that KM is greater than NM by the hinge theorem z must be greater than 4 but less than 8. Greater than equal to less than.